One of my all-time favorite humans, Carl Sagan, said that we are stardust pondering the stars. He also said that we are a billion, billion, billion atoms contemplating the evolution of atoms. Isn't that beautiful? Like, whenever I hear stuff like that, I just feel so precious and so insignificant simultaneously. And the same thing happens when I see images like this. What we're seeing here at the top corner is neurons in a brain. The next image we recognize, it's a tree with its hierarchical structure. We have our roots, the branches, the leaves, and the veins. Then from there, we have the Midwest at night from a satellite. The next two images on the bottom row are artist depictions of dark matter in the universe and a map of the internet today. And the last one, maybe my most favorite, is a recent discovery. These are mushrooms that connect trees in the forest. So when you drive by the woods, you're actually driving by a network. And as a tree is attacked or it's dying, it sends its warning signals to all the other trees around it through that mushroom. Or it'll send its nutrients in chemical form to all the other trees next to it as it starts to die. That's amazing. That's so cool. And so I want to talk about this idea of these systems and what they've been teaching me lately. Specifically, these structures, if you notice, they all look really similar. They're all information systems that are shuttling energy, data, information, me and you, from point to point. Humans are clever, and we've found a way to take that energy and turn it into, well, binary code. And so that means that if energy is present, it's represented as a one. And if it's not present, it's represented as a zero. Most of us know this. We also know that we found a way, and we continue to find ways, to shuttle that information through a processor at unfathomable speeds. And this is a bit of my origin story, this idea of recognizing that this language that we have universally adopted across the entire world, this binary code, is something that takes data, turns it into information, and then we can turn it into experiences. So, a little story here. Last summer, my lovely partner started working with the astrophysics department here at UWM. And I'm looking at VR in my studio. And VR is that virtual reality where you put goggles on and you can like look around and everywhere you look, you're seeing something. So I said in front of a couple professors uh, that wouldn't it be cool if like when we were kids, we had these view masters and everywhere we looked, we had like a, a pocket planetarium. And what I didn't realize is that saying these kind of things around Dr. Kaplan and Dr. Erb, it just happens. It's going to happen now. So we, we teamed up in the studio and what they did is effectively took data from a spreadsheet. You know, for them, it's probably beautiful, but they were able to take that data and inject it into a file, like yolk into shell. And before I knew it, this is what the first example of what that data looked like. And it hit me. I was like, oh my gosh. I can take data, turn it into information, and then have an experience. And that hailed me. As an artist, I always have to pay attention to what hails me. And this was a moment. So I started the Immersive Media Lab here at UWM, and it's this idea that we are immersing ourselves in the data that we're creating. Every day we have our Fitbits and our iPhones, and we're publishing and tweeting. And now I want to take some of that data and embody it and use it and stick my head directly into it. So that's what this first test with this pocket planetarium was. And for me, it was interesting, but when I started allowing other people to try it out, that's when the next level hit me. So little kids, right, they get into these goggles and they immediately go wherever I want to take them and they start pointing at things, grabbing stuff because their, their brains are ready for a new language. And that hit me. I realized that this, this little girl, in 10 years, she's going to want to have a place to go 
and play with this. And so I thought, well, okay, I need to learn everything I possibly can. I don't know anything about this stuff. I've been playing with it. Now I want to get there. And so I want to show you what it sounds like as people start entering into this information space. Uh, as we start to experience new technologies, we start to latch on to our prior experiences and we start to think, okay, well, what if I added this and added that and brought it all together? So listen closely, <laughs> the first one, to the first time someone gets their hands inside a computer. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Hey. Oh, 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 my God. So he's inside the Immersive Media Lab. This is Marvin, and he's actually able to grab data with his hands. This little boy is in Google Maps, and I want you to notice how he's not quite sure where, where to step. He's on what we call the portal, so he knows that he's safe, but also look at the screen. Just like all children, he understands almost already how to navigate that space. Now listen very closely for this. <laughs> Mark is, is literally gone. He has no idea that I'm watching him and he's just shooting him up. His brain is somewhere else. And that, to me, is powerful. We're literally taking data and turning it into experiences. But this tech is tech that makes you feel feelings. And before, uh, Bailey had said that I am a professor that teaches at the intersection of art and culture and technology. Well, what does that mean? What I'm doing is I'm helping creatives, artists, designers, by looking at pieces of our culture and teaching them how to use technology to then go and make messages that go right back into culture for us. And it makes perfect sense that I spend all of this time thinking about culture and technology in order to see where we're going. But our biology primes us. And this, this new technology, it's an empathy machine. We feel it when we're inside this space. So let's see what this looks like. This is what empathy looks like. These are people that are hearing a story, watching a movie, or uh, seeing pictures, and their brain, when it experiences something, starts sending out all these chemicals. And those chemicals cause the blood flow on the surface of the skin to start to react. It'll either speed up, get warm, or slow down and get cold. Play a little game. Which one up there looks like depression? I'll give you a hint. It's black and blue. Which one looks like happiness? So the top row is what they say simple reactions to experiences, and the bottom row would be more complex. I'll just point out shame for a second. Look at the cheeks when you're embarrassed of something. So I want to talk about this happiness and its drive towards technology. So when I see two people, and they obviously don't know each other, and one of them drops something or falls, and the other person rushes over to help them, I don't immediately think, ugh, gross. What the heck are you doing? No, in fact, it's quite the opposite. When I see humans getting all humankind with one another, I think to myself, oh, we're going to make it as a tribe <laughs> of people. <laughs> Look, our bodies are primed to interact with one another. We're going to do a thing. Uh, we're going to show you what this feels like yourself. I'm going to change a slide, and when you see a thing that pops up, I would like you to point at it. Nice. Nice. Okay, that was it. That was it. Some of you were too cool for school, and you're like, I'm not going to point at that thing. But you still looked. You still followed our gaze. That is something that's evolved into us. You see, when we point at a thing, we're not just pointing, we're pointing together. We're sharing focus together. And this is the basis of language. When I realize that pointing is an ancestor to language, I realize that language is a type of abstract pointing, and that I get to share things with someone else by finding the right words or the right images. Now, realize that we made this. So language is a technology, and that that technology is evolving. 
Now, while I was putting this talk together, I realized that I literally point all the time at my computers. Right? And what does it mean to share focus with a computer? Well, sure, I share, I'm sharing focus with all of the information that is known to us. I spend most of my time looking at cat memes, but I share all that information. But I'm also able to do something like this. This is a, a picture or a video that I took while I was on vacation, and I wanted to point at that sunset with people on the other side of the world. So I put it together and I shared it on Facebook. So not only are we pointing at all the information available to us using that digital language, but we're also pointing at each other. And this isn't a map. This is from 2010, but this isn't a map. This is nothing more than the connections that are made on Facebook. Kevin Kelly, in his book, The Inevitable, says that we're using the internet to stitch ourselves together. That's beautiful. But I think it's something more. I feel like we're using this technology to create a type of nervous system so that we can understand what's going on all over the place faster than we've ever been able to before. So I want to now distinguish what is born from what is made. That's an important thing to understand as we move into this next step. What is born has a storage problem. Our genes, the thing that carry information from one generation to the next, have nothing to do with technology and culture. In fact, they can only encode for the organism and its maintenance. So humans were clever enough to circumnavigate that problem. And we created cultures and technologies. Here's what I mean by this. So, uh, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins coined the term meme. He wanted it to sound like gene. And so as <clears throat> something happened in an environment, someone else saw it, like the two people who were falling, right? And what we do is we copy what they're doing and we emulate that and then before you know it, someone else sees us doing what, they, what we copied and this idea the concept or the way that I'm using this tool is spreading throughout all of culture. So this means that we can use these memes to transfer ideas from one generation to the next. So let's take the wheel as an example. We start with the wheel round. We can use human power to be able to push really, really heavy objects. Okay, great. Now give it a couple generations and someone says, hmm, what if I put an axle between two smaller wheels, put a board on it, put an animal in front, and boom, I've got a chariot and I'm cruising, right? A couple more generations and someone says, ah, this friction thing is a problem. I'm gonna put some tracks down, use this newfangled steam power, and now we're gonna be able to haul and change cultures. That's fascinating because as each one of these generations experienced the new technology, they attached their prior concepts to that new technology in order to make something new out of it. But it doesn't stop there. Memes allow us to innovate from one generation after the next so that we don't have to literally recreate the wheel. But again, I want to go back to that happy feeling we get when we see other people. Um, so somebody falls and someone helps them out and you think, oh wow, next time somebody falls, I want to help them too. So I'm going to emulate that activity. And then I emulate that activity, and before you know it, someone starts to tell other people about it using that whole technology of language thing. And then someone starts to write it down using another technology we invented. And before you know it, that story turns into a mythology. And then it turns into somebody's, a part of somebody's overall world belief. And then it goes into all of culture as something like the Good Samaritan. This is a colloquialism that most of us know. We understand what it means to be a good Samaritan. So these institutions, churches, colleges, uh, they allow us to take the memes that are in culture and perpetuate them. They give them a signal boost so that many, many people will see them. And generation after generation has the right memes so that it can start attaching new concepts. So memes allow for cultures to evolve. What this means is that while I was putting this talk together, I realized that oh, culture is a technology. We invented it. That's huge. 
as I walked around, I started thinking to myself, is that technology or is that culture? Is what I usually call technology nothing more than a device? So our technologies are allowing us to see things differently as well. What I'm about to show you is an idea flooding through the internet. It's sped up, but you can see the real-time interaction of that down in the lower left-hand corner. This is coming from a, a data visualization company out in San Francisco called Stamen. And at first, it's an explosion. And then you see all these little branches off of this idea as it's getting emulated and shared throughout culture. Look, that's beautiful. And it looks an awful lot like the first images that I showed you. The connections between these things are important. And I feel like I can learn from them. And you can too. I'm using them in the Immersive Media Lab because now I can understand putting myself into a system like this and navigating similar structures. But it's more than that. I understand that this little girl is going to grow up into a world in 2027 that is the evolution and product of our technologies and our cultures. And it's my job to put the right memes into culture and show people how to use that technology properly. You see, the thing that I want you to walk away with today is to understand that what is born and what is made are different, but they are interconnected. The things that we make and the actions that we take, those are the things that we need to understand are part of us. They change our biology. They're from our biology. So, Humans will always reach farther. We will constantly look for our place in the stars. But what is born will always use what is made to understand what's at the other end of its gaze. Thank you. <laughs>